When I was about five, I got a toy train. It was called a bump and go train, and I just loved it because I never knew which way it was going to go. Its path was indirect and unpredictable, but eventually it always found its own way forward. About the only thing that could ever stop this train is if its batteries died. To live a passionate life, I've had to practice being like this train and learn how to move forward, how to hit walls, and how to change directions so my batteries don't die. Now, what the train does automatically hasn't been easy for me. But the greatest teacher I've had in learning to bump and go is music. Now, my parents loved and cared for my two sisters and me dearly and incredibly well. But there was a lot of arguing. I remember sitting at the top of the stairs just wishing it'd stop. As I got older, I participated myself. But there were times I was afraid our whole family would just break apart and there was nothing I could do about it. But music made peace in our home. We even had a music room with all sorts of instruments and stacks of records we all loved. Dad on the piano or banjo, or mom singing, or familiar record was like comfort food for our family. There were nights that we stayed up singing, dancing, and playing, all together connecting through, mu through music, because music helped us feel the love we knew was there, but didn't always know how to show. And my favorite memories as a child took place in that music room. And in my early teens, I started going back there to create chords and progressions on the piano. And the sounds made me want to sing, and the singing felt good. Uh, it was soothing. Sometimes my mom came back to see how I was doing. You know, a lot of people would say I learned to play by ear, but really I learned to play by heart. My heart led the way, and my fingers and voice followed. Playing by heart is the most important lesson I've learned in how to live like that train because your heart is where your batteries are. Your heart is your power. Now, when trains go, it's called locomotion, literally, to move from a locus or place. I think living with passion takes loke emotion <laughs> because it's nearly impossible to keep bumping and going if your heart's not driving you. And that's the catch. Hitting walls always hurts a little. But when you lead with your heart, it hurts more. It's always the first thing that gets hit. I mean, I, in my experience, if your heart's not getting dinged up a bit, you're not pursuing your passion. Someone should invent, like, a helmet for your heart. You know, the root of the word passion means to suffer. But in a good way, music and my heart for music locomoted me through high school and college. And I did all kinds. I even sang in a gospel choir called the Ebony Singers. You can believe it. It's true. Um, I'll never forget the double and triple takes I got the first time I walked with the choir down the aisle of a black church in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, but I felt welcome there. And music was a bridge that connected me to other people. It was a way for me to build trust and confidence and compassion. It was how I made friends. And when I graduated college, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. But I knew that if I wanted to succeed in life, I better align my passion with my mission. And while I loved music, I was more into, at the time, what music had opened my eyes to. And I wanted to find work that would help bring people together, help lift folks up, and help others find their loke emotion. So in 91, I joined the Clinton campaign and wound up in DC, and then later worked with business leaders, all for about 10 years. I like to think we made some progress, but you know, really there was a lot of arguing about how to get things done and how to change the world. And after 9-11, I, like a lot of people, was afraid that the whole world might just break apart and there was nothing I could do about it. And that's when I remembered the music room. Music was the passion I had taken for granted. Music actually was that heart helmet protecting me as I hit walls along the way, helping me find my voice and find the courage to move in new directions. I couldn't turn my back on it this time. Even though I was just over 30 and needed a real job, I needed music more. Now, looking back on my decision to sacrifice steady income in order to write and produce love songs, uh, 
while trading stocks to pay rent uh, does seem a bit risky. Especially since I had no experience with audio recording, music production, or stock trading. <laughs> it's true. But I was really, the only risk I really was worried about was the risk of not doing it. I just felt like if I don't do music now, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. So I launched my label, Peace Labs, with the tagline, Music Saves Lives. And what about the business? Uh, songwriting. So songwriting for me was a daily clinic on how to live like that train. I learned over and over that hitting walls is a natural, even automatic part of the creative process. I mean, I might struggle for days on a verse or a hook and realize, wait, I'm hitting a wall right now. It's okay to let go and try another direction. I learned to trust that while I may not always know exactly where I'm going, while my path may feel painfully indirect and unpredictable, as long as my heart's in the right place and I keep at it, eventually I'll find my way. Now, I know today's topic, as you know, is the pursuit of passion. Music taught me that if you want to find your passion, you must find passion in your pursuit. Now, I also learned that pop music is a young man's game. And after five or six years, just the notion of creating an image or counting friends on MySpace was literally killing my batteries. But when I hit this wall, the music waiting for me there was no longer just my own. It was the idea of music as social impact. Music as service for the world. What I called a musical Peace Corps. I just, you know, I had worked in the, in the White House um, on the AmeriCorps program, on the legislative team that created the AmeriCorps program. And so it was easy for me to imagine thousands of musicians serving as teachers and mentors and community care workers and public servants, wherever music can reach, teach, or heal, like in public schools and after-school settings and in children's hospitals and veterans' hospitals and senior care and hospice care with foster youth and immigrant children and kids with special needs and communities of all kinds. Now, this vision called on all my passions, and I called on all my friends to help. And after 21 long months of bump-and-go advocacy and nearly going broke, Hewlett Foundation jumped in, others joined us, and we launched Musician Corps. Right about there, Musician Corps. I'm happy to report that after, you know, since then, Musician Corps has impacted thousands of lives. Like Kevin, a student at June Jordan High School who learned more than just guitar. He said, I've learned how to be patient, how to play with others, how to be a better person. Or Donald at the Gift of Love Hospice, who was so moved by our first visit that when we showed up the second time, he had bought a whole band's worth of equipment for us with a simple request that we just keep coming. Or the veteran at the VA's Community Living Center who said, I never thought something beautiful would happen to me here, but this drumming is creating something beautiful, and I've been so lonely. This has gone way beyond my personal passion. This is about Kevin and Donald and that veteran's passion, which is why it's hard for me to admit that Musician Corps and hundreds of impactful music programs are running low on batteries right now. When someone's passion becomes an organization charged with igniting passion in others, sustained low emotion takes more than just heart. It takes money. And I can think of no better investment when music does so much for so little to help solve society's most pressing problems. Like we have a dropout crisis. And we know that kids who study music do better in all subject areas and are more likely to graduate on time, regardless of socio or economic background. And veterans, 
You know, a friend of mine uh, runs a veterans organization, and he told me that a soldier needs four things to survive on the battlefield. Food, water, ammo, and music. Literally. And he's also a veteran, and he knows what he's talking about. Well, our soldiers are home now, and they're committing suicide at the rate of one a day because of severe depression, PTSD, post-traumatic stre- um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and traumatic brain injury. Yet we know that music can be an effective intervention in all these areas. Just ask Gabby Giffords, who learned to sing words when she could not speak. And later, because of music therapy, was able to lead the nation in the Pledge of Allegiance just a few weeks ago. And in this innovation-driven economy, where workers need to continuously innovate, we need to develop the core skills of innovation like perseverance, flexibility, and creativity in our workforce. And what better way to do that than through creative practice, where we try one direction, we hit a wall, we listen and learn, and we try again. This is what artists do. It's what entrepreneurs do. It's what engineers and scientists do. Do it enough, and you too, like that train, eventually will find your way, your passion, your killer app, your theory of relativity. Seriously, Albert Einstein said that he discovered his theory of relativity by intuition. Dude had a sixth sense. But music, he said, quote, music was the driving force behind that intuition. Steve Jobs used music strategies to turn Apple around with innovations like iTunes and the iPod. And there is a civic music movement in the making that has the potential to set passion free in so many people who deserve the right to reach their potential. We can't let them down. We can't pass this up. This fragmented field of music at the heart of service for the world must come together. We need it to. And musicians can help lead the way. I heard the Black Eyed Peas raise four million bucks for charity last night, last year. They might have done it last night, too. (laughs) Because, you know, musicians and artists and their fans do so much for so many causes, it's easy to forget that music is the cause that makes it all possible. Now, my wish would be that if every musician just did one show a year for us, just one with us for music. After one year, we'd build an institutional endowment and the legacy of a musical Peace Corps that I guarantee will change the world. And I say to you, if music ever helped you, if music ever provided you with relief when you hit a wall, please join us. This movement needs you. There's a seat at our table for you. Together, we can seriously transform lives through music, from premature babies who receive music to develop and accelerate their growth, to disengaged youth who just need a reason to want to come to school, to seniors with dementia and Alzheimer's, whose favorite songs often unlock memories when nothing else can. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, Each person has their own unique song that only they can sing. Unfortunately, most people go to their graves with their songs unsung. But if we want to solve the great challenges facing us today, people need to find their songs and sing it, whatever it is. We need some serious low emotion up in this world right now. You know it, and music can help us do it together. If music can help Gabby Giffords, and Steve Jobs, and infants, and athletes, and Albert Einstein, we know it can help those who need it the most. I've seen it. Like Jesse, a middle school kid from a Chicago neighborhood that had been nearly torn apart by gang violence. In the middle of all that, he said of his after-school band, I feel comforted. I feel like family with everyone. 
Everyone deserves music. And my passion is to make sure they get it. Now, about 10 years ago, my parents finally got divorced. They're happily remarried now, but until about two years ago at my wedding, at our wedding, the whole family hadn't been in the same room together. And my sisters and I were nervous, put it that way, about what might happen. But at the rehearsal dinner, they surprised us all. During the toast, they stood up in front of everybody and with great courage and love sang a song that they had worked on for months just for our night. A cappella and in harmony, their passion transported that room, that dining room, back into the music room where there was healing and happiness. I was so thankful for their gift of music. But I was also reminded that whatever walls we run up against in life, our batteries will never die as long as we keep living by heart. Thank you very much.